In Los Angeles County, California, the battle continues in the Jinx murder trial with accused killer Robert Durst on the stand going at it with the prosecutor John Lewin. We have the latest. If you can, Mr. Durst, rather than trying to figure out where I'm going, if you can just answer my questions, that would be appreciated. Will you agree to do that? I will agree to try to answer your questions, even if they seem extremely deceptive. In Brooklyn, New York, day four of the racketeering and sex abuse trial of R&B superstar R. Kelly, we have a live report. He told me how to think, act, and be. Those were the words of the second alleged victim on the stand. Jane Doe number five detailing for this jury the demeaning rules she says she was under while living with the defendant. On the docket tonight in Chafee County, Colorado, a mom goes missing on Mother's Day. And now, Barry Morphew is charged with the murder of his wife, Suzanne. Tonight, the latest from the courtroom in Morphew's preliminary hearing. I'm nearly certain she never got on the bicycle. I honestly believe she was taken the night before Mother's Day. Um, just all the evidence points that way. In Grand County, Utah, a couple is found shot and killed at a campsite in the mountains. And tonight, investigators still searching for a suspect who killed Kylan and Crystal. What is very uncomforting is that um, there 100% is a murderer on the loose. In tonight's Unsolved Case File in Cincinnati, Ohio, an 18-year-old basketball star is lured by a social media message to a no-outlet street and is murdered. Tonight, we are asking for your help in finding the person responsible for killing Sereno Foster Jr. If anybody knows anything, please come forward. Please try to help us out. I wouldn't want anybody's family to go through this or feel this pain that I'm feeling. I cry for almost every day. In Martin County, Florida, a 17-year-old murder suspect on the run tonight. We look at the dramatic video with our law enforcement experts. Vehicle got off on Martin Highway at 2124. Ready for a pick, get ready for a pick. In Milwaukee, Wisconsin, police have difficulty finding new recruits as the violent crime continues to rise. How can police get more people to sign up? We take a look during crime time. I don't know how I'm going to staff my dispatch center in the future, how I'm going to staff my officers just to make sure that I'm getting to where I need to be to cover my shifts. Plus, it's been one year since the shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin, which resulted in demonstrations and riots and no charges against the officers involved. Tonight's 13th year question. Looking back, how do you see Jacob Blake? A victim or a criminal suspect? Go to our Facebook pages and tell us what you think. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us here tonight on Closing Arguments. And here we are, a brand new day, a brand new week. And Robert Durst still on the witness stand, still on cross-examination, fourth day of cross. And, and the longer, I'll be honest with you, the longer this cross-examination goes on and this back-and-forth battle with Prosecutor John Lewin, uh, the less I have a handle on what it really means and how it's being taken. You know, initially there were some great, great moments for the prosecution when he basically admitted on cross-examination that uh, if, in fact, he had committed the murder, he would lie about it. I mean, to me, that was like, you know, mic drop moment. But now it's continued day after day after day, and, and Robert Durst at times coming up with little zingers, little lines. Does he seem like less of a killer the longer he's on there? Is the jury at all getting to know him and perhaps bond with him as some sort of, you know, older, kooky uncle or something has had this crazy life? Or is the prosecutor completely dismantling him and, and showing this jury that he is just a liar who changes his story? You know, whatever, he, admits, he, admits what he, he admits everything that he can't deny, right? So um, it, it's, it's unbelievable. It, it's unbelievable the way this has all transpired. And, and as I sit here tonight, day four, second week of this cross-examination, I'm wondering, what is the jury taking from this? And is this helping the prosecution? Do they need any more help? I don't know. I, I honestly do not know. Now, in the Jody Arias trial, when she was up on the stand for a month, I kind of got a, a, a feeling on that because 
it, it was relentless, but there, there, it was just outright lies, and there was no, there was nothing coming from Jody Arias that was like, oh, that was interesting. Did you see what she did there? Now people are saying, hey, did you see Robert Durst? Wasn't that funny when he did this or he did that? It, we're in a different place here. Anyhow, finally today we start getting to um, the victim in the case, Susan Berman, and now cross-examination about her. She's the actual victim in, in this case, this trial, these charges. Let's take a listen. Susan told people that she had provided an alibi for me, and she told at least one person that the way she had provided the alibi was by calling Albert Einstein Medical Center. So listen to my question, maybe you answer it, but I'm not sure. There are a couple of different possibilities, Mr. Durst. Your position could be that, you know what, those witnesses who are saying Susan said that to them are either mistaken or they're lying, or they are neither mistaken or lying. Susan told them that, and she was lying. Which is it? Susan told them that. And she was lying. So now Susan's lying, too. Susan's lying. He's admitted his own lies. Then he's been caught, I guess, in some other lies. He's changed his story. But is, is Susan a liar, right? I mean, if she's a liar, then there would be no motive. What does this all mean? Let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Payne, who joins us live tonight from Los Angeles County, California. Chanley, great to see you out there on the left coast. Um, let's begin with, with the way... This is going relative to the victim in the case, Susan Berman. Uh, those line, that line of questioning, how is Durst handling it? How is the back and forth going? You know, it's so interesting to watch for several weeks this trial on court TV, but then to be there in person, what a different experience it is. I can actually see all of the jurors sitting there in the jury box. And what was noticeable, especially during this exchange between Prosecutor Lewin and Robert Durst about Susan Berman and about all of those people that she insinuated or told that she helped cover up for the disappearance of Kathy Durst and the prosecutor naming four different people. As they went through that exchange, I noticed some of the jurors, and many of them have not one notepad, but two notepads. It's day 48 of the trial. They would go back through, and they're flipping through, going back and maybe referring to past notes and comparing maybe what they had written previously to what they were hearing today. And that stuck out to me as interesting because that means these are diligent, astute jurors who are paying attention. And that's really what I gauged all day long. Some would just sit back, not take any notes all day long because this is day 48 of the trial. And most of them, though, were actually taking occasional notes. And this is a big moment because it's actually about Susan Berman. And that's why we are here at this trial. Absolutely. I mean, this is the ultimate question. I know there's a lot of other things that, that are important here as well. And when you talk about Susan Berman, you have to talk about Kathy Durst because it's all about uh, the alleged alibi here. So um, how about the, the, the timeline of Kathy Durst and how all that plays uh, into the way this back and forth is going and, and how Robert Durst is explaining this to the jury now on cross-examination? This was another big moment today during the cross-examination with the prosecutor asking about specific days. He started with February 1st, 1982. We know that as the day that Kathy Durst disappeared. And he was trying to pinpoint Robert Durst and his movements of what he did that day and then the days following, the next three days following to February 4th, because he was contradicting, Robert Durst was contradicting some of his past statements and written, handwritten notes and interviews of what he did and didn't do in those following days. Again, prosecutor, prosecutor Lauren trying to catch him in these inconsistencies and in the lies for this jury. But one of the big moments on February 1st, Vinny, I have to point out is that Prosecutor Loon was able to show this jury that Durst went to a hardware store that day, Calder's in Connecticut, the day you know, his wife disappeared, and he likened that to what Durst did after Morris Black was shot and killed. He shot and killed Morris Black. He went to the hardware store. He admits he bought some things to help dismember his body. So that's what the prosecutor is wanting this jury to take away. It's the same consistent behavior, modus operandi for Robert Durst. It was a powerful moment, and the jurors were taking note of it. That's, uh, that's really significant, right? And, and that's one of the reasons you bring in these other parts of the case. But when you start seeing a, a pattern like that, that, could, that, that is something that could really um, resonate with the jury. 
So um, speaking of that jury, as you look at this jury, does it, does it, inside the courtroom, is it like every other trial? Is it, is it different? I mean, just the way we've been watching it, it's more like a Hollywood production than anything, right? And, and we're seeing this very personal cross-examination. Is there anything different, you think, for the, the way the jury's receiving it from your perspective being in there? It is up close and personal, not just where Robert Durst is sitting in his wheelchair, which is in a walkway next to the witness stand, which makes him feet away, a couple of feet, four feet away from the jury box. That They're right there on top of each other and Lewin sitting so close to Robert Durst as he cross-examines it. Everything is high drama. Uh, I mean, just look at the defense team, dramatics. They will overemphasize every objection. Uh, Dick DeGaron will stand to make his objection. Sometimes he'll stand for several seconds before he actually speaks, which draws the attention of the jurors in the courtroom. Uh, David Chesnoff, several feet away from Dick DeGaron in the courtroom, will remove his mask, whisper audibly where everyone in the courtroom can hear an objection to Dick DeGaron to make during cross-examination. It is it's nothing really like I've ever seen because it's a small, it's a big courtroom, but a small place in the well where everyone is. And these jurors literally have, you know, feet away from the prosecution, the defense, and of course, uh, Robert Durst there. Unbelievable. All right, Charlie Payton, stand by. Let's bring in our think tank tonight. Joining us in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, criminal defense attorney, civil rights attorney, Kesia Early is with us. In Atlanta, Georgia, criminal defense attorney, Michael Bixon. And in Chicago, Illinois, criminal defense attorney and attorney for R. Kelly, Steve Greenberg. Uh, great to see everyone. Let's, uh, uh, Kesia, uh, the longer he's up there, does that make him more endearing potentially? Or does it make him more sinister? as these lies and stories are told. Well, I'm getting lost with the lies. I mean, are the lies as important as the confusion that the prosecutor is creating? I mean, he's focusing on details, in my opinion, that are just too small to, to matter in this case. Redirect the attention back to Susan Vernon. He's losing the jury in this case. And I mean, at this point, we know that uh, Mr. Durst is a liar, but does that make him a killer? That's the question. Uh, Michael Bixon, this is uh, fascinating to watch for our viewers, but what I take away from their reaction is, you know, some of them are like, oh, uh, he's kind of getting bullied a little bit, and they're feeling maybe just a little bit sorry for him and, and feeling like, oh, yeah, he's got a couple good lines in there as well. I mean, can, can this man charm a jury or a well, juror? I would love to invite every single one of them to be on every one of my future juries if that's their thoughts and feelings about it. And don't get me wrong, it's entirely possible that he could be working his way somehow into the hearts of the jurors who are watching this play out. I'm honestly very surprised about that from what I've seen. I think that the amount of lies and inconsistencies that we've seen would really turn off a lot of jurors to what he's been saying, even post or pre-lie, although they seem to be sort of intertwined throughout most of the testimony. Um, and, and usually for most jurors, that really is a turnoff. And, and everything after that, they, they seem to either tune you out or just disbelieve you. So I, I mean, you know, fantastic if that's their thoughts, and I would love to have them on any one of my juries from, from now on. Steve Greenberg, the prosecutor has really become one of the central characters in this trial. And there are a lot of trials we cover where, you know, the, the, the prosecutor is very vanilla, for lack of a better word. It just kind of, you know, presents the facts, makes, makes the arguments, but not really, like, doesn't really, like, jump off the screen. In, in this case, mm -hmm. even though for, for television purposes, we're pretty much seeing the back of his head, he's still extremely prominent, even more so in the courtroom. Is that a good thing or a bad thing for a criminal defendant? You know, I, I, it's hard to say when I'm watching this, it, it's like two guys sitting at a, at a table in the corner of a cocktail lounge, having a conversation about some events that occurred long, long ago. Look, it's been going on for day after day after day after day. Uh, these jurors have already, I'm sure, tuned out the prosecutor and tuned out Durst and are just sitting there being polite. But if they had little placards, I'm sure they would raise them up and say, enough. <laughs> Interesting. All right. Well, we've got more for you, folks. Let's take a listen to more of this back and forth between prosecutor and Robert Durst. Mr. Durst, I know you have said that you did not give Susan money to keep her quiet. Is that correct? Correct. 
Let me ask you something. I want you to assume for a moment that Susan had damaging evidence that you had murdered your wife. If that were the case, you agree, you would have certainly given her money whenever she asked for it, correct? Overruled. Overruled. If Susan, this is one of these hypotheticals. I did not murder my wife. Susan would not have had evidence that I murdered my wife. And if Susan wanted to get money from me, she would ask me to give her money. You know, the, the point being made there by Durst is that a lot of the questions from the prosecutor have been very hypothetical. Uh, Steve Greenberg, that's kind of unusual. Uh, that I agree with the defense who objects every time it happens. When you have an expert witness on the stand, you can give them a hypothetical. They're going to give you an expert opinion. I've never seen a case where a prosecutor is allowed to say, well, imagine if this happened, would your reaction have been this? And, and as if it's some evidence, because that's not what necessarily happened. It's not the way to ask it. Now, there is a way to ask it. He could have just said, you gave her money because you wanted to shut her up instead of giving these weird hypotheticals. But I think that's a problem for the prosecution if, if the case goes up on appeal. All right, we've got a lot more to get to, folks. Uh, when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, R. Kelly on trial in Brooklyn, New York, a live report when we return. What was alarming to me was the consistent behavior of people inside Robert's camp that were bringing underage girls around with fake IDs and then getting a payment settlement. And I have documentation, as you saw in the videos, of all these this inside corruption. There was an enterprise going on, but it was to uh, the exclusion of Robert because they were capitalizing on his lack of education, on his maniacal work ethic, on the fact that he, he you know, I don't want to say he's illiterate because I don't like that negative connotation, but he does have compromised reading and, and learning skills. Um, he has said that. So that it's easy for someone to take advantage of you. Welcome back. That was fascinating, right? An inside view of R. Kelly's world. And that's what this trial is all about. The allegation is he's running a criminal enterprise to sexually abuse young women and underage girls. And... That was Sharon Winbush. Interesting, she's saying, yeah, there was an enterprise, but it was to the exclusion of R. Kelly, Robert, as, the, as they call him. Fascinating. Um, R. Kelly back in court today, day four. Take a look. No cameras. Thank Chief Justice uh, Roberts for that. Not allowing cameras in federal court, but there's uh, R. Kelly. Uh, and a lot happening once again here on day four. So let's bring in Court TV legal correspondent Julia Janae, who is joining us live from Brooklyn, New York tonight. Julia, great to see you. Um, let's talk about Jane Doe number five, important witness taking the stand. A very important witness. She is the second alleged victim, victim in this case to take the stand. And she's really expanding things for the prosecution's case. We're not just hearing about one incident with one woman and another incident now with her, but she was able to tell this jury about what seemed to be a group of women who all are under these rules of the defendant who were all very uh, subservient to him. She said that he was uh, trying to groom her, wanting to bond with her. She was 17 when she first entered into this sexual relationship with the defendant and she admits she told him she was 18 at the beginning, but in the middle of the relationship, she did admit that she was 17 years old and instead of sending her away permanently, he worked out a way where she could still live with him and be homeschooled, this with the consent of her parents. Wow. Wow. 
This is, uh, so now we're getting really to the heart of, of this case. Uh, Julia, Janae, what can you tell us about the atmosphere at, at court? I mean, how has it been uh, at the courthouse, inside, outside? Well, Vinny, inside, this information is difficult to listen to. This is very explicit testimony. The things that Jane Doe number five has been testifying ab about today, she's talking about having to urinate in a cup because she wasn't allowed to use the bathroom. She accused the defendant of forcing her to eat feces while she was there. All is part of this grooming process where she wanted to do whatever it took to please him. So inside the courtroom, you still have supporters for R. Kelly who are here a day in and day out. Outside, things are slowing down a bit. We had some weather with the tropical storm here in the area. So not as many people outside of the courtroom, but uh, things are moving along for this case. It's expected to go another three weeks. And here's a bit more from inside of court, that testimony of Jane Doe number five. She broke down on the stand, even after telling us all of these really explicit things about this sexual encounters that she had with the defendant, which sounded like repeatedly. She also said that after she received a diagnosis for a sexually transmitted disease, vaginal herpes, that this really tore her apart. She felt like he knew that he had it and that he had intentionally infected her. She also described that she was chastised by him, sometimes physically um, in the form of spankings. Uh, if she did anything wrong, if she had an attitude, if she didn't follow his rules, and she says that he held her in a room for four to five days. This happened on multiple occasions. We even saw an exhibit in uh, the trial today of this studio in Chicago on Justine Street where she said there were bedrooms. It was a music studio, but inside one of the control rooms is where she was kept for multiple days. And just to go over some of those rules that she told this jury about, one that her wardrobe had to always be baggy, had to be sweats. They could not look or be attractive to other men, that they had to ask permission before leaving the room that they were in from Kelly. I had to call him daddy and immediately give him a kiss when he entered the room that he discouraged communication between family and friends when they were spending time with him. They had to delete all of their social media and had to, quote, act like a child, part of the act, think, be that she read from as rules that were given to her by the defendant. All right. Stand by, Julie Janay. Let's bring back in our think tank. Still with us, uh, KC Early, Michael Bixon, criminal defense attorneys, also Steve Greenberg, who was representing R. Kelly on these charges uh, previously. Uh, Steve, I'll get to you last. All right. I, I want to hear, um, Kasia, your, your reaction to this testimony, Jane Doe number five. Well, just to hear the allegations, they're absolutely horrible. But we have to remember as a defense attorney that it's simply that. Allegations, uh, the prosecution, whether or not they can prove that, number one, uh, these actions occurred when the minors were actually minors as opposed to uh, being adults and whether or not these were willing acts between the two, uh, the ladies and uh, Mr. Kelly. Uh, but we hear a consistent story throughout. He had his set of rules. They had to follow those rules, but he also had help. So I suspect that with the testimony of Mr. Smith, who was testifying in exchange for immunity, uh, that will be damaging testimony for the defense. Michael Bixon, there, there's, this is some bizarre stuff, right? Setting up these, these rules and the things that have to be done and um, if the jury believes this, oh, we lost Michael Bixon. But we've got Steve Greenberg. Steve Greenberg, um, your reaction today to Jane Doe number five on the stand? Well, I don't want to get too deep into the weeds on it because I've been privy to the discovery and I'm still bound by the protective order in the case. But I think what's important, Vinny, is that no matter what you think of what these witnesses are saying, and, and people are going to not like this, but this is what the law requires. You got to look at what he's charged with. So he's charged with running a criminal enterprise. If these are Robert's rules that Robert's telling them, if Robert's doing things to them and so on, if it's Robert, 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 it can't be a criminal enterprise. So you may find it just. And Steve Greenberg has frozen on us as well. Let's go back to Julie Janae. Julie Janae. Live in Brooklyn tonight, Demetrius Smith, Casey was mentioning uh, that testimony. That's also significant when you start putting together the allegations of this criminal enterprise. What did he have to say? It is. He was under cross-examination today. He was a former tour manager 
for Kelly's back in the 80s and 90s. And he's the one who was in the room when the marriage between 27 year old Robert Kelly and 15 year old singer actress Aaliyah uh, happened. Uh, that is part of the bribery charge in this case. It's at count one, act one of the racketeering. So Smith's testimony really important because he's able to tell this jury that he did go and bribe an official, gave them money to get a fake ID for Aaliyah to be able to get married. So here's a bit from court today where Smith was testifying. He uh, said on cross-examination, so from the defense attorney for Kelly, he asked, uh, you to Robert told you that Aaliyah might be pregnant. That was the trouble that was assumed to be why they had to get married. And Smith said that is what he assumed, but to his knowledge, Aaliyah was never pregnant. And we know that marriage was later annulled. Uh, another point, though, and one of the biggest points that the defense was able to bring out on cross-examination, is Kanick asked the witness on the stand, Robert never had anything to do with your bribing anyone to get a marriage license. And Smith said, that's correct. No, he didn't. So there is part of that charge that says Kelly had to knowingly and intentionally cause someone to bribe an official in order for there to be for it to be proven that there was a bribery. So could be a challenge, but the prosecution still has many more witnesses to call. All right, let's bring back in our think tank. We got the full tank once again. Uh, Michael Bixon, let's talk about Aaliyah. She was 12, apparently, when she met R. Kelly. At 15, they were married. Then there was a fake ID. But all of a sudden, it's coming out that uh, this guy's kind of acting on his own a little bit. And R. Kelly's not necessarily, according to the testimony. So where does, where does that leave us? Is this just a guy who's got an entourage who's trying to take care of the, uh, of the boss to keep him happy, to keep him safe? Or is R. Kelly but the one who can't apparently read or write running a criminal enterprise? And I think that's the question here. I mean, from what we've seen, we see a lot of evidence not against R. Kelly when it comes to this, but to his associates. And look, it's R. Kelly, the one really at the head of this. At least that's what the prosecution's saying is happening. And so if you have all these other people, all these other actors that are really going outside and doing their own initiative to do whatever they want and, you know, do illegal acts, you know, it's hard to really point the finger at him and say it's all about him, that he's really the ringleader here. And so I think that the state, or sorry, in this case, the federal government is really going to have a hard time with all this coming to light. Yeah, and R. Kelly obviously is the one who makes all the money, and he keeps everybody else afloat monetarily. Steve Greenberg, you, you froze in, in the middle of your answer last time. I'll let you, you finish your thoughts about this, and I know you're limited in some of what you can say, having right. represented R. Kelly in this case, but, but go ahead. Well, what the testimony from Mr. Smith, I think, uh, points up exactly what I was saying. He said, no one told me to do this. If no one told him to do it, uh, then it's not part of the enterprise. It wasn't at the direction of the enterprise, and it wasn't in furtherance of the enterprise. And, and that's really where they have to pick at this case. Uh, everyone's going to be disgusted by the rest of the testimony. I frankly don't know why so much is coming in about his sex life and the details and all that, because that doesn't go to the enterprise. Casey, you know, the jury is going to hear directly from the Jane Doe's. Um, do you think this jury is going to say, listen, these are allegations. These are serious allegations. Um, it would be nice to hear from the man who's being accused. And, and we know criminal defendants, presumed innocent, don't have to testify. Do you think this jury, in a case like this, where you've got the Jane Doe's coming in and testifying, that it's going to help R. Kelly to tell his side of what was going on? He'll definitely not help R. Kelly. And if the defense attorney is doing his job, he'll instruct the jury based on the jury instructions that it's the defendant's constitutional right to testify or not to testify. But in addition to that, uh, the jury instructions also uh, instruct the jury you can't uh, render a verdict based on how you feel or if you feel sorry for the alleged victims solely on the facts. So if this is an organized crime that affects interstate commerce and uh, R. Kelly was the head of that organized crime. They have to judge it based on those facts. All right, we shall see. Let's check back in with Julie Janae, see what's coming up next in the trial. Julia? Vinny, Jane Doe number five is going to have to get back on the stand for at least another hour of direct examination, and then she will be subject to cross-examination. So that could take up most of the day tomorrow. All right, Julie Janae in Brooklyn tonight. Thank you so much. Still ahead.
On the docket tonight in Chaffee County, Colorado, a mom goes missing on Mother's Day. And now, Barry Morphew is charged with the murder of his wife, Suzanne. Tonight, the latest from the courtroom in Morphew's preliminary hearing. I'm nearly certain she never got on the bicycle. I honestly believe she was taken the night before Mother's Day. Um, just all the evidence points that way. Plus, it's been one year since the shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin, which resulted in demonstrations and riots and no charges against the officers involved. Tonight's 13th year question. Looking back, how do you see Jacob Blake, a victim or a criminal suspect? Go to our Facebook pages and tell us what you think. On the docket tonight, missing mom Susan Morphew. Her husband's been charged with her murder. The preliminary hearing happening right now. Let's take a look at um, how we got to this point. Oh, Suzanne, if anyone is out there that can hear this, that has you, please. We'll do whatever it takes to bring you back. We love you. We miss you. Your girls need you. That's Barry Morphew in a video posted on YouTube back in May of 2020, begging for his wife Suzanne's safe return. And just under one year after the 49-year-old mother of two vanished, her husband, Barry, was arrested and charged in her death. We're announcing that at 0915 hours this morning, the Chaffee County Sheriff's Office arrested Suzanne Morphew's husband, Barry Morphew, he was taken into custody near his home in Poncha Springs. He was alone at the time of his arrest, and he was arrested without incident. The investigation is still ongoing. Uh, Suzanne, her body has not been found, and we are still looking into that. The investigation is ongoing. Details of what happened to Suzanne are still unknown to the public, but Barry Morphew has been charged with tampering with a human body and first-degree murder. The Morphews lived in Maysville, Colorado, a rural area about two hours west of Colorado Springs. The family relocated from Indiana in 2018. Suzanne was last seen on Mother's Day in 2020. Her husband told investigators she went for a ride on her bike and never returned home. Her bike was found down a hillside off a trail, but no other signs of Suzanne. We're looking for torn clothing human remains and things of that nature. Suzanne's older brother, Andy Mormon, joined friends, family, volunteers, and law enforcement in the search for Suzanne. Mormon said he doesn't believe Barry's story about the Mother's Day bike ride. I'm nearly certain she never got on the bicycle. I honestly believe she was taken the night before Mother's Day. Um, just all the evidence points that way. And Suzanne's husband, Barry, was noticeably absent from the searches and from speaking publicly something Andy Mormon found suspicious during the months he was looking for his sister. Very, very suspicious. I mean, if it was my wife missing, there's nothing that I wouldn't do. There is no level of cooperation that I wouldn't take care of. Uh, I just, I don't feel like Barry stepped up to the plate at all out there. He's uh, kind of hidden himself from all you guys. And if it were me, I would want all the media attention I could get. I would be forming a search party just as I'm doing now. And uh, he hasn't done that, and that's troublesome to me. Barry previously told investigators that he was in Denver 150 miles away at the time Suzanne went missing. But prosecutors say Barry is accused of killing Suzanne sometime between May 9th and May 10th of 2020. And on May 5th, 2021, 360 days after Suzanne went missing, Barry Morphew was arrested near his home in Poncha Springs, Colorado. He is currently being held without bond. And he's in the middle of his preliminary hearing right now. Prosecutors trying to deliver enough evidence to get this thing bound over for trial. Day three of that prelim. And a lot of information coming out, including the fact that a Morphew allegedly made five trash runs on May 10th, 2020, okay? Dropping garbage off at the bus station, at a hotel, at a McDonald's, at Men's Warehouse. Who drops their garbage off at Men's Warehouse? Okay, also, Morphew says that he had no knowledge about a tranquilizer dart sheath found in a dryer at his home. Investigators also found an inoperable tranquilizer gun in empty vessels 
of the darts. What was going on inside that house? And why is he throwing garbage out all over the place on the day his wife goes missing? Let's bring back in our think tank. Okay, see you early, Michael Bixon, Steve Greenberg. Michael Bixon, I'm starting with you on this one. Let's talk about the garbage run. It's the day she, she's reported missing. It's Mother's Day, and he's throwing garbage out at the hotel, at McDonald's, at the bus station, and then, of course, uh, at, at Men's Warehouse because uh, it's guaranteed no one's going to find that garbage at Men's Warehouse. What, what's going on here, Michael? A little sketchy. A little sketchy. I mean, look. He's still innocent until proven guilty, no doubt about it. But when you have actions like this, it certainly makes you give a skeptical eye as to what happened. I mean, it's pretty typical that the police are going to look to the loved ones, a husband in this case, as to, you know, who might be the first kind of suspects. And then when you have additional things like tranquilizer darts laying around and going out and making multiple garbage runs, uh, you know, you start to really question things. And so I'm not totally surprised that scene gets bound over to Superior Court for a trial. Yeah, I think he's going to need some evidence of, like, uh, um, I don't know, bears stealing his picnic baskets in the backyard of his house. That's why he needs the dart guns. But, Steve Greenberg, let me show you the beautiful home that they lived in. Okay, now this is a guy who I think is claiming that he is he's very um, cheap, right? And that's why he, he, doesn't, he doesn't pay for the garbage service. Because when you live in an $800,000 house... Uh, you can't afford garbage service, Steve Greenberg. It's all relative. What does that mean? Well, one man's eight hundred thousand dollar house might be another man's two hundred or another man's two million. You can't you can't say based on the price of the house that the guy could afford garbage pickup. I okay. mean, but I'll let you play your clip. Okay. Well, well, we we don't have that picture of the house, but it's beautiful. It's it's wonderful. I, uh, I'm sure it is. Look, look, Vinny. There's no reason. I mean. Jurors are rational people. Uh, why would you throw something out in someone else's trash? And why would you throw something out driving around town at, at five or six different commercial establishments? Uh, so when this case hits the trial court, as it will, uh, there, there's not going to be any explanation that anyone's going to buy for that, except he was getting rid of evidence. So, uh, Casey, which would, should the defense be more concerned about, the garbage run or the, or the, uh, the darts? Definitely the tranquilizer. I mean, unless he's out there hunting, uh, there's no explanation of a tranquilizer in a dryer. I mean, this case reminds me a little bit of uh, the Chad Isaac case, where there were items in a place where it normally should not be. And in this case, you have this tranquilizer. But even beyond that, look at the, the markings. And he had abrasions and scratches on his arms and hands and fingernails. So if not the tranquilizer, if not the trash, definitely the uh, scars that he had on his hands as well. All right. Things are going to continue tomorrow in the preliminary hearing. Let me put up on the uh, screen right now. No trial date, though, set. The trial date will be contingent. First, prosecutors have to win here. They have to win the prelim, and then we should get a trial date if, in fact, the judge finds probable cause and enough evidence to bind this over for trial. We'll continue to follow for you right here on your front row seat to justice. In the meantime, when we come back, time to hear from you. It's been a year since Jacob Blake was shot in Kenosha, Wisconsin. Um, he survived. He can't walk anymore, but he was shot by police. No charges for police. You remember there were protests and then riots, and then there was the whole Kyle Rittenhouse thing? Well, that was all after Jacob Blake uh, was shot by police. When we come back, we're going to hear from you on, on a year later now, looking back. How do you see Jacob Blake? Do you see him as a victim, or do you see him as a criminal suspect? Your verdict will be coming. The following segment includes graphic content. Viewer discretion is advised. All right, that was the viral video of Jacob Blake being shot by police. You remember last year when it happened? Then we had the protests. Then we had riots. Then Kyle Rittenhouse uh, uh, shot three people. All of that happening after this video went viral. Well, there were no charges against police. No charges against the officers after the investigation. But now it's a year later. 
and, and folks are kind of reflecting on, on what happened a year ago. Sarah McGroove, a reporter for our great affiliate WTMJ, has more for us tonight. Downtown Kenosha is calm this morning with just a few storefronts still boarded up like this one here behind me. But it's a different picture than the weeks and months following the police shooting of Jacob Blake. In a statement, the Kenosha mayor says, I can tell you with confidence Kenosha has moved forward to unify and heal. But despite a cleaned up appearance downtown, community leaders still believe there is work to be done to restore relationships. And that includes everything from police reform to business recovery. While many shops and restaurants that were impacted during the unrest last year have reopened, others have remained closed or continue to board up windows. Meanwhile, Kenosha Coalition Organizing Resolution formed in the last year and is working to bridge the divide in the community as well as interrupt violence. The organization is hoping to further the conversation between community leaders, police and residents. And the Wisconsin Professional Police Association also calling on those conversations to happen. There's a lot of divide. I don't know where it comes from. But hopefully one day they'll be able to come to the table and talk. It's a long process ahead of us. Well, I think it's, you know, the leaders of the, you know, uh, the agency, the chief, as well as, you know, the local police union, you know, the group that represents the officers to, to, you know, have frequent interactions, frequent meetings with uh, faith leaders and leaders of communities of color just to uh, recognize that an open dialogue benefits everyone. Although division still exists, it's clear that the intent to rebuild is there. And the Kenosha Police Department also says it's making some changes, including body cameras for all officers starting in October. All right, so I posted this and asked the question, looking back, how do you see Jacob Blake, a victim or, or a criminal suspect? And overwhelmingly, uh, not a lot of sympathy for Jacob Blake from the 13th juror. But we begin with our 13th juror comment of the day from Michael. The police are taught to react accordingly under life-threatening situations, possibly overkill, but no time to roll the dice when your life is on the line. You live by the sword. You die by the bullet. Uh, KC, how do you see Jacob Blake a year later here? I suspect that answer you have to. It's, it's underlined in race. You have to look at uh, this, the uh, size that everyone's taken. I look at him as a victim in this ongoing battle for basic human rights, and that's justice for all. Uh, we have to look into criminal justice reform and police reform. And as much as I'm tired of talking about it, I know that your viewers are tired of hearing it. And we're all going to get tired of hearing it until change is coming. I mean, I have a 16-year-old son. And um, one of my early conversations, even before he started driving, was uh, what to do when you interact with the police. I shouldn't have to have this conversation. We know that African-Americans are disproportionately affected um, from a simple traffic encounter. Uh, we have to look at whether or not that uh, force was unnecessary. Was it justified? And looking at that video, we know it's not. And the lack of sympathy from the viewers, it just informs me that change is coming, but it's coming rather slow because we're not on the same page. Lucy tonight, he deserves everything that happened to him. I hope he spends the rest of his days reflecting on his behavior and volunteering to help young people from making the same life mistakes as he did. Michael Bixon, how do you see Jacob Blake a year later? I mean, I think that there were definitely mistakes made all around, you know. I mean, we know that the police officers responded, that there was a scuffle, that he had warrants out for him. Does that mean that they should shoot him? Uh, that's where it becomes questionable, right? I mean, if they saw that he was actually reaching for a knife, that he had a knife, maybe. But I think at the bare minimum, it was reckless what they did. Now, you know, whether it would amount to criminal charges is a different story. Civil, certainly. Um but, you know, now we're in this really weird spot where, you know, you have a lot more mistrust in the community because of actions like this. And so I do think that there are lessons that can be learned from this, positive lessons for everyone involved. Um, you know, running from the cops is almost never a good idea for anybody. But at the same time, I think officers certainly need to, one, have body cams so we have a better idea as to what happens, and two, to react accordingly to the level of threat they actually do perceive. And Shannon, tonight, Jacob Blake's girlfriend called the police because of a domestic incident. Jacob Blake didn't comply with the officers, which leads to being shot several times. Doesn't make him a criminal suspect. I would say he's a victim because the officers use excessive force, too many bullets to the body. Steve Greenberg, we have about 15 seconds. I'll give you the final word tonight. One, one bullet was too many. You know, uh, I agree with the, with the other attorney who said you have to explain to people. They treat people different. They treat people in the black community different than they treat people in the white community, and they shouldn't. This shooting was completely unjustified. All right, Steve Greenberg, Michael Bixon, KC Early, thank you so much. Appreciate your time, your insight.
Uh, we'll see you again really, really soon. When we come back, we've got a murder mystery in Utah, a newly married couple. Details next. In Los Angeles County, California, the battle continues in the Jinx murder trial with accused killer Robert Durst on the stand going at it with the prosecutor, John Lewin. We have the latest. If you can, Mr. Durst, rather than trying to figure out where I'm going, if you can just answer my questions, that would be appreciated. Will you agree to do that? I will agree to try to answer your questions even if they seem extremely deceptive. In Grand County, Utah, a couple is found shot and killed at a campsite in the mountains. And tonight, investigators still searching for a suspect who killed Kylan and Crystal. What is very uncomforting is that um, there 100% is a murderer on the loose. In tonight's unsolved case file in Cincinnati, Ohio, an 18-year-old basketball star is lured by a social media message to a no-outlet street and is murdered. Tonight, we are asking for your help in finding the person responsible for killing Sereno Foster Jr. If anybody knows anything, please come forward. Please try to help us out. I wouldn't want anybody's family to go through this or feel this pain that I'm feeling.